Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. It's good to see some familiar names in the chat as well. That's it's good to see you're uh, you registered for the for this webinar. We're very excited to have John Grady with us today to present develop a game plan. In this presentation, John will explain why transaction costs can make or break a trading strategy, and why certain markets tend to be better than others for retail traders. He will also discuss the importance of waiting for ideal conditions and how to use order flow analysis to adapt to the current movement. So John will consider a few things, um, the, one of which will be the impact of commissions over time, tick to commission ratio, products with the lowest fees, thick markets versus thin markets, pros and cons for both, and the auction market theory. Don't overcomplicate it. He will also discuss good action versus bad action, why waiting for the right situation is critical for long-term success. And uh, as a note, John will be demonstrating this on Jigsaw Day Trader. The Jigsaw Day Trader is fully integrated into TradeVate. What that means for TradeVate account holders is they can use both TradeVate and Day Trader at the same time with the same TradeVate login. Because of this setup, unlike other firms, there are no additional order routing or market data fees. Traders can also choose from one of TradeVate's three pricing plans that will cover trading on either TradeVate or DayTrader. For active traders on DayTrader, TradeVate offers membership-free pricing in which traders pay a standard commission as they trade, but we also offer two subscription, subscription models. Uh, the active trader, where there is a flat monthly fee, as well as a reduced per side commission. And lastly, we offer a commission-free for a flat fee with no commissions at all. In all cases, standard exchange, clearing, and NFA fees will apply. And these plans can be found on our website under the pricing section. The TradeVate Jigsaw integration also means that traders can have access to TradeVate's market replay feature. And uh, this feature is included free in the active trader subscription and uh, $49 per month otherwise. It allows traders to replay any session back to January 1st, 2017 and it includes unfiltered data, level two data, so it's a, it's a very useful tool for uh, testing strategies, especially on the weekends when, uh, when the markets are closed. And uh, what is unique about TradeVate's market replay is it's cloud-based, which means no clunky downloads, and it can be started, stopped, and the, the speed adjusted as needed. So before we get started on the webinar, let's just go over the standard disclaimer. Brokerage servitude, services are provided by TradeVate. TradeVate is a member of the NFA and registered with the CFTC. This is not an offer of, or solicitation for brokerage services or other products or services in any jurisdiction where TradeVate is not authorized to do business or where such offers or solicitation would be contrary to local laws and regulations of that jurisdiction. Futures and options trading involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Investors should understand the risk involved in trading and carefully consider whether such trading is suitable in light of their financial circumstances and resources. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. So after the presentation, we will open up for questions and you can submit them in advance for uh, consideration. So we'll, uh, we'll, let, uh, we'll let John Grady kick off now. And um, again, if any questions come up, feel free to uh, write those in the chat and uh, we'd be happy to go over those later on. Welcome, okay. John. Thank you, Bastian. I appreciate it. Um, if again, if at any time, like you can't see what I'm pointing out or something uh, isn't working properly, just interject and let me know. But I'm assuming everybody can see my screen here. Uh, hopefully you should be seeing a document that I have up. Um, thanks to everybody for attending today. I appreciate uh, you showing up. Obviously this is a, a joint presentation with uh, Jigsaw Trading and Trade of Eight. Um, in these presentations, I know that I often get a combination of new traders and experienced traders. All right, so typically in the beginning of the presentation, um, I will cover some things that might seem a bit basic to experienced traders, but then I try to get into uh, some stuff that's a little more advanced. And then if you're a new trader or contemplating it, whatever, the stuff that I cover in the beginning, uh, it's things that you need to know for sure if you're contemplating um, trading, day trading, all right? So 
what I typically do is I start here with a document. It keeps me on point for a few minutes. Um, I cover some critical ideas and scroll through it. Um, and then after that, what you'll see is I'll pull up some uh, video of uh, some price movement and, and the ladders, the order books. And I will um, attempt to maybe help you explain or help you understand some things you don't already know, right? That's the whole point about uh, these webinars. All right, so let's get into it. <clears throat> First and foremost, with Jigsaw and Trade of Eight, since we're all operating as a unit today, uh, these are two companies that obviously I recommend and support, um, and I'll tell you exactly why. So with Jigsaw, um, Peter contacted me years ago and I saw the Jigsaw platform and I immediately saw many of the benefits to it. One of the benefits being these inside columns. Um, it splits the uptick and downtick prints. This might not seem relevant to a lot of people if you've never looked at the order book, but it's extremely helpful. This is just one of the many features uh, he's developed over the years, which is beneficial. Um, if you don't know what you're looking at in an order book, let me just point you here now, okay? Um, on my website, I have a videos page, and there's all kinds of videos I've posted over the years. These are all free. Um, <clears throat> if you go down to this video, it's order flow basics. Uh, what is the DOM and why is it useful? That explains exactly what you are seeing on the order book or in the depth of market, the DOM. Okay, it's called a depth of market, so DOM for short, ladder, order book, whatever, right? I would recommend watching that if you don't know what you're seeing. It'll explain everything, okay? Uh, so Jigsaw is a great platform. It's what I use. They've incorporated a way to connect it with Tradevate, as Bastian described, so you eliminate the connection fee, which is huge. We're gonna get to commissions in a minute. Um, will reduce your costs substantially. All right, and one other thing about about Jigsaw, which I like, um, and I've been just promoting because it's so useful to customers of mine, is the journalytics feature. And just as a quick note, basically, his the journalytics feature is just something. Um, this is just a sample on their on their website. It allows you to very quickly look at what you've been doing in your trade results and break them down uh, in a very specific fashion. So this is just one type of thing that you can do. You can break it into a week, time of day, time the trades are held. Um, and, there, and the reason that I'm pointing this out is that everybody should do this in their trading because, for example, you might find out that you never make money on a Monday, right? Not always the case, but if you trade for six months and you never had a winning Monday, then perhaps you shouldn't trade on Mondays, right? Uh, or you may find out that you do very well on Mondays when things are slow, but in fact, you don't do so well maybe on Fridays going into the weekend, right? So uh, that's a, a one feature, but you can use it for all kinds of stuff. So the day trader platform and journalytics are very, very useful. Um, I highly recommend them. And they, they help a lot with order flow analysis. Okay. With trade of eight, I'm just gonna briefly go through these savings and it's just simple math. However, a lot of new traders do not fully appreciate um, the effect that commissions have on your bottom line over time, all right? So again, this is basic, but we need to go through it so that you understand really how important this is. And it's something that I discuss all the time right up front in my material. So, to break it down, um, actually, I discovered Trade of Eight through a customer of mine. Uh, a student of mine contacted me, said, hey, have you seen this new company? And they're coming online. They had this membership thing instead of a, a per side fee. So I looked at it and um, contacted them. And we went back and forth a bit. And again, just like with Jigsaw, I realized immediately the benefit of this model that they've instituted. Um, and honestly, for what it's worth, I, I think it's trailblazing, and I think every broker will eventually have to adopt this. It's it's that powerful. Um, and if you break it down, like I'm about to do, it's really a no-brainer, <clears throat> especially for people who trade volume. So what they have, 
obviously they have a plan that does not require a membership as Bastion discussed. Um, and you just have a per side fee and this is what you're going to, you know, if you're a one lot trader or two lot trader, this is what you're going to be using in the beginning to learn. But if you start doing any kind of volume at all, and it does not take very long um, to do volume if you start trading, day trading for real, the savings become immense with the membership. So just as a basic comparison, most brokers will charge 50 cents a side. Typically they try to charge more. Um, actually most try to charge more than that, but a few out there may charge 50 cents a side. Um, so I'm going to use that just as a quick example or as a comparison compared to the trade of a commission. Okay. So that's in addition to exchange fees, right? So your, your competing brokers are about 50 cents a side plus a connection fee of 10 cents a side the standard. So you're looking at about a dollar 20 around turn with the trade of a commission free membership. It's 18 cents per round turn. All right. So you save a dollar and two cents per round turn. You can quickly see how huge this is. If you have a five lot trader making five turns a day, very easy to do 125 turns a week, 500 turns a month, um, 500 turns, the competing broker, 600 to commissions, 500 at trade of eight, 90 in, in clearing. All right. Even with the membership fee, you pay $310 less than the next closest competitor. And I can say that with confidence because most people are never going to give you nine cents a side or 10 cents a side um, ever. Some might give you that, but only if you're doing 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 turns a month. It's pretty ridiculous. So the savings are huge. If you go from a five lot to a 10 lot, same amount of turns, a thousand turns a month, instead of spending 1,200 in commissions, you spend 180 in clearing. Um, with the membership fee, even of $200, you're still paying $820 less over one month than with the nearest competitor, right? So, I mean, if, you, if you're a, basically a 10 lot trader, which isn't huge for people that start um, doing some volume and some, some trading, even at that, you're talking about a savings of $10,000 a year. You know what I mean? Even with the membership fee. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple questions about the platform and trade of eight themselves. I'll try to get into that and I'm monitoring both at the same time, but the executions are fine. Everything functions perfectly. They don't have issues. Uh, it works with day trader as Bastion mentioned. So you can connect, you buy, you don't have to pay the 10 cent connection fee per side. Um, it's just a really great platform and a great company and a great business model. Okay. So for what it's worth, I definitely, if you're not using them, I recommend uh, looking at their website and investigating farther because if you do any kind of volume, you're going to be saving a lot of money uh, over the course of a year. All right. Highly recommended both products. Let's now dig into some other elements of this just in terms of products. All right. There's something that I discuss in my basic material, and it's, it's the tick size to commission ratio. Um, I actually don't know if anybody else has ever used that term, but it's what I use. It helps to explain it. <clears throat> what this means is how many ticks do you have to make to cover cost of your trades? So if you break it down to tick size, all right, you have the 30 year is this, this what the ZB is, a 30 year treasury note, treasury bond, excuse me. It's $31.25 a tick. Uh, the cost to trade that per round turn is $1.82. So you have to basically make one tick per 17 trades to cover costs. What that means is if you make 17 trades, you're about at $32, right? So therefore every 17 trades, you're gonna have to make one tick to cover your cost for those 17 trades. The reason this is important is because if you start going down, like for example, the bond is $10 a tick. The cost to trade is $1.08. Um, you have one tick per nine trades to cover costs, right? If the ES is $12.50 a tick, even though the tick size is more than the bond or let's say the Euro stocks, the cost to trade it is more, it's $2.58. And this is because of exchange fees. This is not because of commissions, all right? So the exchange fee and the CME 
to trade treasury bonds is cheaper and notes is cheaper than trading the s p futures or the e-mini s p futures um so therefore if you if it costs 258 around turn to trade you have to make one tick per five trades in the es versus one tick per 17 trades in the bonds now obviously if you trade the ES better than you trade the bonds, then okay, then you're gonna to wanna to trade the, the ES or whatever product you choose. You have to know how to read the product correctly and make money first and foremost. But if you're learning, the question that has to be asked is, doesn't it make sense to trade products um, with a higher tick size to commission ratio, right? Where you only have to make one tick per 17 trades instead of one tick per five trades. Again, we're talking about saving money, and gaining a bigger edge over time. I've worked, some people may not know this, I worked for um, several proprietary trading firms in my life. Uh, the first one was an equities firm, and then I worked for two futures firms in Chicago. I was in downtown Chicago. And so some of the, you know, some of the edge there that I learned back then, it's been reduced for the retail trader since then, but it's just low commission rates. You know, it really doesn't make a difference and it enables you to take more trades and not pay as much. So you have more shots at making money without all of your money being eaten up in commissions and fees. Okay. So something else to keep in mind as you progress. All right. <clears throat> now we get into thick markets versus thin markets. And let me just take a moment here to discuss, um, current conditions. Just give me just one second. All right, I apologize. <clears throat> we have a bit of a, a unique situation. Uh, everyone is obviously aware of this. Um, given what's been going on last week and the two days of this week, right? So it's, it's interesting in one way because I've never had an opportunity really to show the idea of context in a presentation like this and have it make immediate sense to everybody watching. I mean, it's going to be so crystal clear that it's almost impossible to not understand um, the idea. The flip side of that is that the conditions are so volatile right now. Um, it's extraordinarily dangerous, uh, particularly for new traders. So I'm going to talk about it in two ways. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it under, I guess the idea of normal conditions, which really would have been just a couple weeks ago. Um, and most all last year. Right. And then I'm going to kind of cross that with what's going on right now in the markets. So, let me just give a quick example so we can get right into this, okay? This is a um, video that I have of just a couple weeks ago. This is February 20th, all right? So less than a month ago. And what you see here, um, I have four treasury products. I have the 10-year, the 30, the 5, and the Ultra Bond, and then the E-mini S&P is on the far right over here. Okay, this is my normal workspace, the products on which I focus most of the time. And if you look at the volume on the bid and the ask, all right, you'll notice, for example, in the 10 year, that every single price on both the bid and the ask, um, except for the current price trading, has at least 2,500 contracts available. Right, so 2,500 at the very end here, 29, 3,600 here, 3,300, 3,300, 3,600. If you go to the other side, you have 3,000 on the first three prices uh, with 2,500 or more all the way down, 10 prices deep, okay? That's your liquidity. That means right at this moment, there's currently 3,403 contracts available on the bid. If a guy wanted to sell 3,403, he could hit that and all of it would be there. There's a lot of contracts, right? Uh, in the ES, <clears throat> you can notice that there's 200 or more at every price on the bid and the, out and the offer. Now, <clears throat> the reason this is important is because this is what determines volatility. 
okay? Um, and again, this might be basic for some, some people, and I'm going to get past it, but for newer people that are just looking at trading, you know, they don't completely understand this, and therefore I have to cover it in the, in the intro of the, the discussion of today, all right? So you have 200, 200, 300, 300, right? It makes for a slower, more methodical ebbing and flowing. If you look into today, well, this is yesterday. Yesterday at the noon hour, 12.41 p.m. Eastern, instead of seeing 3,000 or 2,500 at every price in the 10-year, you see less than 1,000 at most prices. So less liquidity, right? In the ES, obviously, instead of seeing 200, 300, 400 on the bids and the offers, you're seeing 20, 30, 40, or even in some situations, you know, 8, 10, 15, 5. All right? Uh, Peter and I were talking before this webinar started. I was recently explaining to a friend of mine just last week. Um, he's just a guy who dabbles in the markets, not day trading, just, you know, buy, hold, sell, hold. He didn't know what the order book was, and he wasn't understanding the volatility. So the reason I'm explaining this is because this is why markets become extraordinarily volatile. All right? You end up having a situation where if the markets are slower, you have market makers and big firms, they're willing to work whatever. They might be willing to normally work two or 300 contracts in the S&P. Maybe the market maker for the 10-year is willing to work 1,000, 1,500 in the 10-year, all right? When things get weird and, and chaotic, those guys, they're not willing to trade as much, and nor are professional traders that are here every day either. So rather than being willing to work 1,000 or 2,000 on the bid, they're only willing to work maybe 100 or even 50 because the risk is so dramatically increased. So trading in this type of condition where the market's thick is obviously much different than trading in these conditions, which we saw yesterday and then today, where things are very, very thin, okay? This is a cycle and it happens over and over again throughout the years and I wanted to point this out. So this is from today that's from February 20th. Now, if we go back, this is from 2015. A similar situation had occurred in September of 2015. This is the ES over here. This is a different kind of layout that I had. But you see the liquidity is extremely light on both sides. Um, it's less than 1,000 at every price in the 10-year over here. So it was very similar to what we're seeing today and last week. Now, if we flip that, just to show you guys something, if you, if you go on my video page again, you go down to um, it's the ES trade on the jigsaw. It's on YouTube. It's free. This is the ES. Make this big for you real quick. In 2013, a lot of you have probably never dreamed the ES could be that thick. It can be that thick. So things were different. And instead of having 200 or 300 on the bid ask, you had 1,000, 1,500, 2,500. The ES looked like the 10-year, all right? That's rarely happened throughout history, but um, it did happen in 2013. So obviously, trading in a situation where the ES is 1,500 or 2,000 up, as opposed to a situation where it's two by two or 20 by 20, it's going to be quite different, all right? So this is when I talk about thick and thin markets and context. The idea of context is simply that conditions are not always the same, all right? So trading in a more liquid market that moves slower is very different than trading in, extraordinar in an extraordinarily fast market. So trading the notes, the 10-year notes, or the bonds can be quite different than trading the ES. Um, trading, obviously, the 10-year notes against the DAX, there's no comparison. The DAX is com 
wild, right? Because it's only two by two, five by five, ten by ten. Um, that's the reason that gold moves around like it does because normally it's only, you know, 15, 20 by 20. There's some times when it might be 100, 150, but it's not a lot of size. All right. So it's funny. Somebody just posted something about treasuries moving slow. So you'll notice right now they're not moving slow. However, I'm going to get to that in this presentation. So it's okay. I'll, I'll address that. This dictates a different strategy, obviously, right? So thick versus thin. A lot of people tell me treasuries are too slow for them. They can't make money or they don't know how to watch or they don't have the patience, right? That's not always a bad thing. They ha so there has to be some volatility. Of course there does. The market has to move in order for you to make money. But the advantage sometimes in, let's say, treasuries is that there are imbalances in the bid and the ask that are very clear. And if you wait for the spot, you know, it can be seen much more clearly than it can be seen, for example, in the ES or other products. And so one of the reasons for watching the order flow, this is a question that I consistently get, um, is to be able to determine when you can get a better fill even. So what do I mean by a better fill? Again, if, you, if you've never watched the order flow, this is something you don't know, or the order book. It's a very simple premise, but one that you need to understand. Right now, for example, there's an imbalance in the bid and the offer in the 10-year in, in this sample. So there's a bid of 3,400. There's an offer of only 383. Chances are, most of the time in this situation, if I want to sell, I can sell at 9 rather than having to use a market order to sell at eight half. And that doesn't mean I want to sell at nine, right? This is depending on if you're looking at entering a trade in the first place. But I save that tick. So by offering a limit at nine and not paying the eight half, I get a better fill and I save a tick on my fill. Doesn't mean I'm right. You know, it doesn't mean I can't lose money. It just means if I do lose, I'm going to lose one tick less than I would have otherwise, right? And if I make it, I'm going to make one tick more than I would have otherwise. Um, so that can be a very apparent thing in more liquid markets, not just treasuries. There are some other markets um, that are also fairly thick that you can look at uh, that are similar. With the ES, it tends to be a little bit different because there's usually an equal amount, but sometimes still there's a difference. You might notice 150 or 180 on the bid by only five or 10, 20 on the offer, and you can get the fill. You tend to need to use market orders a little bit more in the ES because it's those imbalances don't appear as frequently. Um, but the upside, of course, is that the ES moves more, so you're going to make up for it in terms of um, the movement and the volatility overall. All right, so if somebody said, yeah, do you mean you, you save a tick by joining the ask? Exactly. So if I was to sell right here at 9 instead of using a market order at 8 half, I would save the tick, assuming I get the fill. There's no guarantee, but with the imbalance that's showing there probably – if at that exact moment I place a sell order, I'm probably going to get the fill at nine. And if not, then most likely I can see the bid weaken at eight half and I can use a market order and hit eight half and get short. Okay. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is just volume profile and volume currently trading. You know, this is a situation um, where you're trying to see what's happening in the moment. All right. And so a common question that I get is what's the difference between looking at the order book or looking at a one minute chart? And it's funny because I did a presentation with Peter a year or two ago, or maybe two years ago, and a guy asked this question. And I didn't have an immediate sample uh, to um, answer. And now I can answer very, very easily. And I have a good analogy for it as well. If you're not watching the order book, you're not taking advantage of all the available information. That was my first answer, but that doesn't explain much. Let me explain. For a sports betting analogy, whether you gamble on sports or not, it doesn't matter. You'll get the point. Let's say it's a Sunday and you're watching football or you're watching football, big soccer or whatever, you know, the game may be. And you're looking at a bet. Team A, their winning record might be five and three. Five wins, three losses. Team B might be three three wins, five losses. So at first glance, the team with most wins, team A, would seem to be the best pick. Maybe even team A is, you know, 6-3 versus 3-6 uh, or whatever. 
However, on this day, two of the key, key players for Team A are injured and they won't be playing. That's obviously valuable information that you would want to incorporate into your decision-making process, right? So you might have a great team. Sunday, they come around, the quarterback, you know, injures his shoulder on Saturday. He can't start on Sunday. This is going to make a difference in the game, right? It'll definitely make a difference if there's uh, two or three players that have injuries and can't start. So on the surface, based on the win record, it might look like Team A is, is better, but once you get to the nitty-gritty of it, you realize that maybe Team B actually has a really good shot because of all the good players being out of Team A. So the, the comparison that I use there is if you're only looking at charts, it's similar to only looking at the overall record of the teams. If you watch the order flow, now that's the equivalent of learning more about the individual players on that specific day. So when I talk about context and the imbalances and the, the price action and the pace of the activity, how fast is it, how slow is it, that's what you get from the order book. It doesn't mean that you don't want to look at charts to look at very obvious support and resistance levels, maybe from two days ago or a week ago, right? You can definitely use some technical analysis there in terms of identifying range areas, high volume areas, and the like. But then when you have all that marked, and actually if you see like these R's that I have marked here, those are resistant, technical resistance points. Um, and it would be an S for technical support. That's based on the morning assessment, finding out where, you know, um, obvious technical levels are. You can bring up a chart, no problem. Take away the chart, bring up the order book. Now I can watch the bids, the offers, the imbalances, the pace of the activity, etc. And where this can be really important is, for example, good action versus bad action. So what do I mean by that? If the market's not moving at all, it's obviously bad action. It's dead. There's nothing to do, right? But there can be situations where the market is moving very quickly. I'm not going to read through all this. I'm just going to have it so you can look at it on the recording if you want. Um, so sometimes when things are too fast, and right now, as in today, yesterday, and last week, that can be the case, you're just swinging blindly. I mean, you really are, you know, gambling it up in many situations, um, basically playing red or black on the roulette wheel. So, but let's take that to a more normal circumstance. During, let's say, any normal Monday, usually there's not any news, okay? So the news events take place often at 8.30 a.m. and then again at 10 a.m. Uh, at 8.30 a.m., you might have, I don't have it here, I'm not gonna bring it up now, but you know, at 8.30 a.m. is when you have employment numbers, GDP, CPI, um, that kind of stuff, durable goods, retail sales. During that time, your treasuries are going to be thinner and your ES is going to be thinner, all right? So rather than looking like this at 8.30 on an employment number Friday, uh, your market may, may very well look like this, um, you know, what we're seeing yesterday and today. But it gets like that for a few minutes, usually. <clears throat> so it'll thin. The volatility will increase. You'll have spikes up and down. You won't have as much size trading. That action, particularly in the five minutes following a number release, is going to be highly erratic. And usually it's not a good idea to trade during that time frame. Um, you end up, unless you're really fast, unless you have a program working for you, executing auto, you know, automatically, uh, your manual reaction time is going to be too slow and the numbers are going to move too fast and the, and the price is going to move too fast. But then liquidity comes back in. And so maybe not right at 8.30, maybe that's not a great time to trade, but maybe between 8.35 and 8.50 a.m., that might be a pretty decent time to trade, right? So... And someone mentions people focusing on news, and that's where I'm kind of following up with this. Right at the exact moment when the release happens, unless you have some kind of system that can capture that and not get slippage, you're going to be gambling a bit. But the, the action that follows that can be quite good for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Then you usually get a period where things slow down again between 9 and 9.30. 
and then things slow and often there's not really a lot of good opportunity then. Then maybe at 9.30 a.m. when the stock markets open, you get another wave of activity and things pick up again. So typically, you know, trading uh, a Friday when there's an employment number at 8.35 a.m. or 8.40 a.m. is nothing like trading a Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. when there's no news or even trading maybe between 9.10 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. on any day. Um, when people are kind of gearing up, getting ready for the stock market open. So when newer traders approach this, that's something that they often miss. They're not looking at the context. They're not looking at the different type of, uh, I'll get to questions at the end of this, guys. They're not looking at the different types of activity, and that's what this whole uh, section of my document is about. Psychology, obviously it plays a role right? You can't throw good money after bad. You can't be stupid. Um, a lot of people don't know the difference in the beginning, whether they're making good trades or bad trades, but eventually you figure it out. So you don't, psychology is important and the overall fundamentals are important, but really the one thing that the majority of novice traders miss in the beginning is the importance of context. That's why I'm focusing on it and kind of hammering it right now. Um, you can have these flurries of activity where the action's great for 20, 30 minutes, and then things can literally just go completely dead and flatline for an hour or two hours, and it's all gone. So in order to day trade effectively over time, you do have to get in there, and you got to be there, and that's why you have to show up. A lot of people would discount maybe a Monday or a Tuesday with no news, but in fact, sometimes those days are quite busy, and there can be very good reads made during those days, and then you get to the news day, and maybe the news is right in line with expectations and nothing happens. Market goes nowhere, right? So a big part of it is trading every day when you have the ability and being there during the same time periods and trying to take advantage of the context. All right. So on that note, let me just make sure I'm not missing anything to kind of follow up here with professionals trading size. Um, the problem that no, most new traders encounter as well as first off is they don't understand context and the difference in markets and they've never looked at an order book so they can't see the, how the liquidity affects price change but the other thing is that they come into trading and they want it to be a job that gives them a daily or a weekly paycheck right and for good you know for good reasons most people don't have a lot of money or they're trying to leave their jobs um and they want to be able to turn on the screen and trade from home and make money. And it's like, if I can just figure out a way to make a hundred bucks a day, 200 bucks a day, right? Whatever the case may be, that's all I need. And that's why they get into it. And the reality of the situation for, I mean, I have to say at least 98% of traders, there may be some firms that make money consistently almost every day, but for most people and most firms as well, market makers, banks, everybody else, the money comes in waves. And so it's not going to be a weekly paycheck, all right? Professionals normally trade a lot of money. They trade more size, and they take advantage of the good situations. So right now, you can believe, just based on the order book, that a professional, like I was saying earlier, you know, a market-making firm that might have been willing to trade 200 up in a situation like this, 200 contracts in the ES, that market making firm is trading five lots and 10 lots, maybe even one lots and two lots right now. Um, so as weird as this may sound, yeah, there are certainly going to be firms out there that have lightning fast connections and they're, they're adapting their models to take advantage of this volatility. But over these situations don't happen very frequently. And so typically, the firms and the traders at those firms are making money when conditions are easier to read and not so volatile. I mean, some volatility, again, is yes, after a number maybe, but not like this. So <clears throat> when you hear about a guy, you know, make, he made half a million dollars trading or a million dollars trading or whatever, what you often don't hear is that the person made it, you know, a guy made a million last year but he actually made that million in two months during perfect conditions or 
he was consistent throughout the year, but if you break down his day-to-day -day performance, 15 days out of the month, he was breaking even or scratch or net loss, and then five days of the month, he made a lot of money because he was waiting for the conditions that met his criteria for his edge, so to speak, right? So he, he has something that works for him. Maybe it only works five days a month, but he's really good at sitting on his hands and not doing anything until those days appear. And then he pushes it um, for as much as he can. And so, yeah, the bigger traders tend to make the majority of their money trading size. They're not in there with a one lot and a two lot or a five lot trading gold, trying to catch a thousand dollar swing or a $2,000 swing on a one lot, right? That's not what they're doing. So professional treasury traders, for example, are maybe trading 20, 50, a hundred contracts in the 10 year, or maybe, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 in the bonds. And they're doing that day in and day out. They're not trading a one lot, trying to catch a 32 tick move. That's not how it works, all right? So kind of, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here for questions in a minute, but if, if there was ever a great example on order flow, this is one that I have on video all the way back from 2015. So if you have any questions about how this works, this should answer it. If you look at the bid ask here uh, at 42.25 and 42.50, in the ES, and I, I think I've only showed this on one other, one other presentation a, a few years ago. You'll notice that this book looks a lot like yesterday and today, right? Very thin, except, sorry, you have a thousand on the offer right here at 4250. This is a massive imbalance. It's a thousand on the offer versus a one lot on the bid, 10 on the bid, 18 on the bid, right? 75 on the bid. What programs do and what scalpers do, and, and I know this because I was in the business and this is how I learned to trade. And, and all, I won't say all, but the majority of programs and HFTs were originally built around this method of trading and it's based on floor trading techniques, okay? Scalping originated on the floor. What they're doing is they're reading this offer and if the thousand drops say nine, 800, 700, 600, 500, 400. It triggers off buy orders to buy at 4250. And what they're trying to do is they're reading that offer as disappearing and the thought is if it disappears, most likely it will create a wave of buy stops that gets set off above it, okay? Again, if you don't understand this, go to the order flow basics video. That is the fundamental premise of trading at its core. It's just an auction. It's buyers and sellers and they're meeting at certain prices. And what you're trying to do um, is, as I described here, you're trying to anticipate the next wave of market orders. Which side will they hit? Because if no one's willing to trade higher or lower, nothing happens. Obviously, easier said than done. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that's really all you're trying to do at the core. People make this so much more difficult than it is in terms of, of what's really happening, right? So in this scenario, as this goes 1,000, 900, 800, 700, 600, 500, there were going to be programs reading it at the blink of an eye in milliseconds, trying to execute as that last 100 or 50 trades. And the idea is that as soon as they're long at 4250, this market will spike in their favor and they will instantly work out an offer and cover that position for a profit. Or maybe they think it'll go higher and the program or the trader will wait a second and see if they can get paid more. But that's the idea behind it, all right? And if you see, let's we'll see what happened at that actual time period, you'll notice the volume trades right here and they're, they're going to clear this out. Let me just show you real fast. See that? So they trade everything at 4250, and as soon as they do, the market spikes through that price. Um, and ultimately, what happened is it hung there for a second, but then it ends up rushing higher from that point. 
And so it creates this scenario where right there it shoots out of sight, right? Every firm in the world is using the order book in its decision-making process. Like it just people aren't, and I guess most retail traders don't understand that. Yeah, there's some supply, there's, you know, technical analysis and there's obviously fundamentals, but they are all looking at buys and sells and the amount trading and the bids and the offers. So that's why as retail traders, you also want to watch the order book. So it's, it's a tool. It's a very valuable tool it should be incorporated into your process. And as far as what's going on right now, um, you know, uh, the federal reserve had a meeting today out of nowhere and they cut rates by 50 basis points. And this is going to sound harsh, but it's because they just, they don't know what they're doing. It, this, this is an unprecedented situation in, uh, really in history. Um, so you're watching history in the making literally and, the danger level right now obviously is immense, not to sound weird, but like for us as a human species, um, is, is pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, that's obviously going to affect the markets though, right? So if you're trying to trade this or make decisions in this, you're talking about the coronavirus, you're talking about a potential pandemic, um, you're talking about world governments and banks trying to, trying to support this absurdly overvalued market you know companies trading at PE ratios of 200 300 times companies that have never made a profit trading at you know $300 a share and I saw this in the in the dot-com bubble in 98 and 99 and what I can tell you is very few companies make it out alive um, most go to zero and a few will make it and of course you know like Amazon will probably be one that makes it obviously um, as it did back then, but you know, it's not the point of being a day trader is that you don't try to make the prediction of where the market's going to be even two hours from now, let alone, um, two days from now or two months from now. So if you're running a big fund and you have billions of dollars at your disposal, then yeah, you can go in you can look at grain reports and send guys to do analysis and, and make a longer term play based on cash prices. Uh, if you're a day trader, you can look for short term imbalances and just waves of pressure and momentum. You know, this is my argument against swing trading for the most part is, is I mean, did anybody really know on Friday that the, the Dow would be up 1300 points yesterday or 1200? You know, of course not. You know, it's a feeding frenzy. Um, orders, create other orders which create other orders as a domino effect and everything goes in one direction and that's how you get these big moves. All right. So I guess word number one would be caution is advised. <laughs> you know, if you're not comfortable with this, you shouldn't be trading it. Um, so yeah, it's not, and I'm not talking about the world collapsing and it depends on how people perceive this. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is right now, today in these markets, this is very dangerous. Um, and so the approach that one's going to have during these couple of weeks when things are like they are is obviously going to be quite different than you would have when, when liquidity returns and things stabilize a bit, right? So that's really all that it means. I'm not calling the end of the world by any means. I don't call long-term things like that. I don't call long-term prices. Um, I just try to show the, you know, the advantages of watching the order flow and the, the order book. Um, there's definitely a, uh, quite a few questions here. So on that topic, I will uh, finish, if you guys don't mind, and open it up to questions. Bastion, you want to take control of this and pick the questions out, or do you want me to try to go through these? Um, it, it, it's up to you. I, I've been answering some of the questions here that came through more trade debates specific. Some of the sort of trading questions, I think you're probably the, the man to answer those. Uh, but okay. if you, I, yeah, I can, I'm, I'm I, looking I, through I, them right now. 
Yeah, I pick a few out. I can address a few. One that, like, I was trying to catch them scrolling across my screen. Obviously, I have a lot of them. Um, also, let me just say, guys, like, I don't, I don't think most people fall into this category, but you know, when we do these presentations, this is meant to be informative for everyone who attends. All right, and so if you know all this stuff, then that's fine. That's great. You know. It, the goal here isn't to, to come on to a, like a, a presentation and really be defensive about something. It's more about if you just want some information and you maybe don't know as much about a certain topic or you're looking for a new platform, a broker, reducing costs, etc. All we're doing is offering that information. All right. So like I saw, you know, there's a comment where someone's like, Hey, they shut down in 2008. It was way worse. You know, the world's not going to collapse. Of course, it's not going to collapse. But there's not really a need to make a comment like that. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, I know that. So this is just trying to, to kind of help people learn some things they didn't know. So, for example, um, in this one that I showed about, about the thousand trading, um, I guess it was here back a little bit. Um, yeah, so it was right, right there is where it was. A person asked, why in the world would somebody want to use or want to offer out a thousand contracts at 4250? That person is not going short. That's the whole thing about it, right? So what that probably is, is that's a, a hedge order for a fund and they're most likely working out of a position and they're willing to work out of all of it at that price. Um, and often those orders do act as magnets. It's a weird thing, but it's true. So eventually price does move towards a large order like that. And so they figure they can get their fill at a good price and it works for them. It's not like one big guy out there in the world is trying to hold the market down with an order of a thousand contracts. The guy is, you know, the firm, it's not a guy, you can believe that it's a firm. They have, it's part of a strategy. So they're probably long stocks overall. Uh, or maybe they are, maybe they're long a huge basket of stocks and they do need to work some contracts as a hedge in the ES or they're, you know, long the ES willing to work out of a trade, whatever, but it's not going to be someone trying to hold the market down with 1200. Okay. Um, some of the other stuff that I saw about, you know, spoof orders, that is an issue as well. Yeah. Sometimes there's 3000 showing and it only ends up being 1000. Um, I can't like getting into that in this presentation would be impossible. It depends upon each specific situation, right? You're, you're bound to see more spoof orders in some markets than others. And at certain times of day than other times of day, right? It can mean a lot of things, but it's something that should be watched. Um, what else do we got here? What are the bars at the bottom? Total bids and offers. Yeah, that's just total bids and offers. So, oh uh, no, that that's not actually that's from um, that shows a, a delta. Um, it's called the strength meter, and it's showing the total amount that has hit the bid, which what versus what has hit the offer. Again, that's within the jigsaw. I definitely recommend if you're interested in that, check out the jigsaw uh, platform. Um, Bastion, any of these people are raising their hands, go ahead and, and hit it. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, um, me neither. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just seeing some questions, Paul. But one of them here is um, asking about or mentioning the volume profile in NinjaTrader. So I'm not sure if you've tested the volume profile in Trade of 8, but you could have. You, we, we offer a, a volume profile as well. So you could have Day Trader and Trade of 8 running at the same time. Use, use um, Trade of 8 for its charting and the we have a bid ask volume charts and, and uh, volume profiles and then have day trader running simultaneously so that would be fine yeah and i mean as far as that i mean you like you can a person can create correct me if i'm wrong but uh, they can create an account with you right and download the platform and and uh have a sim account and everything right and just look at the platform as a whole yep, as a whole exactly yeah. they can so, yeah they so sign up for a, for a free trial and you can even use that demo, that simulation with Day Trader. So if you have a lifetime license, a, a Jigsaw lifetime license, you can just log into that demo uh, and use Trade of Eight and Jigsaw as well. Right, and so the connection is great, and you know you can use both, and and all the charting is in the Trade of Eight platform, and 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 Trade of Eight also has uh, you can break down uh, historical P and L and stuff. 
as well. So yeah, I mean, that's something everybody should really just look into uh, in more detail. And the savings are enormous uh, if you start trading some volume. Um, let me just scan back real quick, see if I can find something else that offers. I see here a question about when it would make sense to switch to a, a commission-free membership plan. I will um, feel free just to email us, just support at tradeofate.com with those types of questions. Kind of tell us what you do in terms of your volume or what you're planning on doing. And we can kind of give you a breakdown of, of what would make the most sense, you know, the, the active trader plan or, or commission-free or uh, like John was saying, if you're just doing a, a few lots, then a day, then probably the membership free would make the most sense. But feel free to email us, and we can we can look into that and, and give you a more specific answer. Right. That's and that's definitely person to person, and it's pretty simple to figure out. I mean, if you're trading, you know, two trades a week on a one lot, then it's going to be commission free. Um, but if you get to the point, yeah, where you're doing, you know, uh, a decent amount um, every week, then it's worth doing the membership. Um, here's a question, which is, uh, did you? Did you say that the average day trader capitalizes on looking for imbalances and waves of momentum? Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I mean, so the so the whole idea behind day trading really is is just to try to to capitalize on short term imbalances in supply and demand, um, whether that be playing faster momentum type situations where everybody seems to be going the same way at the same time or whether it might be playing like a range situation, right? Where everybody, uh, these situations develop in the treasuries more frequently where um, the heavy hitters kind of are maintaining in a certain area uh, because, because of the yields. So whatever the case may be, the point is you're, you're not day trading to try to get in at the open at 9.30 a.m., you know, and then figure out where the market's going to be at noon. That's not what it's about. Uh, the idea is that there are periods where there's an imbalance and you're trying to anticipate that and basically just anticipate where um, you think the market orders are, right? So if it's, uh, I actually did a presentation not too long ago. Um, I don't think you'll mind. It's for Futures IO, you know, the, the forum. Um, and I was talking about imbalances like for breakouts. So if you're looking for a breakout through new highs, does it go through highs extremely easily? Um, if it does, in that case, you probably don't want to be a short seller right away. Uh, but if it hits new highs by one or two ticks and instantly drops back in and a lot of volume seems to be holding the high, then that's more, it's not a guarantee, but it's information that lets you know, hey, there's definitely a lot of sellers here. So I probably don't want to be in a long trade just yet. Um, maybe let me wait for some more momentum, some more size to come in behind me. And that's really all it is. You know, you try to find those situations and, and then it ultimately comes down to you as a person, you figure out what, um, where your edge is, right? Um, are you better at trend days? Are you better at range days? Again, are you better after news events or maybe you don't do well after news events at all and you find where your edge is and an edge is simply something that gives you a better than random result. That's all that it means when people talk about getting an edge. Okay. Um, obviously I have a lot of questions here and I can't answer all of them. Um, I think some people probably saw them as I was going through anyway. But yeah, you know, a couple comments about the treasuries being slow. Again, it depends on time of day, right? So if you look at the treasuries normally after 11 a.m., they're usually very slow. The, the, the money in treasuries is typically between 7.45 a.m., 8.30 a.m. When there are number days, the treasuries move a lot. And then that first hour of the stock market open, 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. You know, the ES obviously can have days where into the close, even during normal conditions, it might rally and, you know, have a huge move and the treasuries may go nowhere. But you can't judge treasuries just based on afternoon or, uh, you know, noon hour action. You got to look at it when they tend to be busier. Um, 
John, did you have any um, any comment on what to trade during the like the European session? I see there was a question about that too. Oh, so with the European session, typically I think the Eurex products are probably the best way to go. Although you can also these days watch the U.S. products at the same time. Uh, that's something that I tell my customers. So the the bund and the Euro stocks and the DAX all obviously move. Uh, the bund moves at two a uh, two a.m. Eastern time. Um, so you're talking about you know you got to swap it to Central or UK time. But the bund and the Euro stocks and the DAX, and then you have the FTSE 100. Those are products that do move. And then if you have the treasuries and the ES up along with those, you'll notice sometimes they're moving together, sometimes not. So, you, you know, it's not a guarantee. But right now, the liquidity has been in the U.S. markets during the European session. I mean, you know, the last year, really. Um, so I would say those products. And then I always get the question about Asian products, and I don't honestly have a recommendation. Um, I do know a guy in Hong Kong that trades the uh, HSI, the uh, Hang Seng. But I know Austra like Australian bonds tend to be a little bit slow. And then the Nikkei is sort of hit and miss. A uh, question about hedging, like uh, one long ES, 10 short micro. Probably not a good idea, but I mean, you could try it. <laughs> it um, if the hedging and the, the spreading type strategies typically require quite a bit of experience and you have to know a lot more about how that works. Uh, market vo profile, volume profile. Um, thoughts on using it. So volume profile, when I talk about it, I don't, I don't talk about it, the A's, B's, C's, and D's, like the tr traditional market profile uh, charts. I'm looking at the cumulative amount over the course of the day. Um, that's what this is right here. So this, for example, like the 12,968, that is the total amount traded at 24 on that day. Bring it to something a little more current. Uh, so right here, there's a lot of volume, but you know the market's been spiking around all night. And that's why you have all that volume from yesterday. Um, so that's what that is. And then primarily you just look for spots where there's a lot of heavy volume versus not much volume. And then there's are areas where you'll see the market get faster and slower usually. And so again, the, the idea would be you're trying to anticipate when the pace of activity is going to increase and um, where the market orders are going to hit. That's really the key to everything. Uh, should we treat the 930 open like a major release? Not necessarily, but the 930 open certainly can cause a lot of back and forth. And no, like a 930 open in the stocks usually on any given day is not going to be the same as a non-farm payrolls release on a Friday or a GDP announcement. But you certainly want to exercise caution because it's going to spike around a bit. What kind of support or resistance do you use when prices pass all-time highs and lows <laughs> and you don't have any previous swings? <laughs> you, you watch the volume, really. I mean, it's, that's kind of where we are now. You know, it, it's not real reliable because it's so thin, but basically just heavy volume. Like where is it moving through on light volume and then where do they finally run into some, some uh, heavy support and resistance? Uh, during spikes, does a stop order work? Yeah, a stop order works, but there can be, that's the problem with these days, like there can be a ton of slippage. So even if you have a market stop order at 34, let's say, for example, you may not get filled till 36 or beyond because the market's so thin. So they work, they're going to execute, but where they execute is going to be a different story right now. Um... Question is, have I been trading? I really have not. No, not the last. It's it's so thin and nasty that 
like the risk isn't really justified in my opinion. Um, it can just be far easier to, you know, if you wait for a good day, good conditions, um, really in, in any product, you know, there's just time periods where everything seems to be stacking up in one direction. Now the key is waiting for just those spots and not giving away money from boredom. That's where a lot of people go wrong. Uh, but there are just situations that present themselves. And if you have some experience, you know, well, this is where I want to be involved. And you take the trade and you have your stop loss where it needs to be and your profit target and you go with it. This is so different. You know, there's obviously money to be made, but stop losses are random, completely random. You know, it's not a situation where, you can say, okay, the high of the day is held twice. I still like it. I want to be short and I'll blow out if it goes through the high of the day. That makes sense. Um, you have a game plan, you have a strategy, you stick with it. Whereas, and you have a, a, a reasonable logical stop loss. Whereas in this, I mean, you're just, you know, where does your stop loss go? Well, it goes wherever you, um, I don't know, wherever you feel like putting it. There's not really a, a logic behind it. You always have a stop loss in. You don't misunderstand me. So yeah, you put your stop loss in. But the, the point being, there can be situations where maybe, like I said, I'm short just below the high of the day. And I know I don't want to be short anymore if it goes through the high of the day. So I have a logical stop point in where I have a stop loss place, maybe three ticks above my entry. Whereas in this situation, I can still use a three tick stop loss, but it's completely random. It's just, I don't want to lose more than three ticks or four ticks on a trade, any one given trade, but the market's bouncing around so rapidly that, you know, your win rate is probably going to be reduced substantially. Do I use quarter pricing strategy? I do not. Um, has the style changed over the years? Yeah, you guys just go ahead and type in questions. Um, am I missing something here? Aha. Sorry guys. I didn't have a box open. Um, the strategy is basically the same. It just adapts to conditions, right? So if it's really, really thick, that's, this is a great example. If you go back to 2013, kind of watch the, the thickness and the ES and what I was doing then same concept. You just have to adapt it to thick or thin. Um, that's a great video if you guys want to watch it. Algos to trade evade. I don't know, Bastion. Can they connect? I mean, I, that, I would assume that would just be running through the platform. Not really. I don't think there's any. Um, are there any laws to, dictating that? Uh, sorry to do what to. What? To connect what exactly? If you're, if you're running a yeah, if you're running your own high frequency trading program or algorithm through your platform, I mean, it's just going to be executed normally. There's not really any. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'll just be treated as the same same order, whether it's a, a point and click order or a uh, uh, like an algo. Uh, we wouldn't differentiate that. Okay. Uh, real quick, too, you can answer this. What's what's well, you can look on the website. The all in round turn for crude oil with the membership. It's going to depend on the membership, right? So it's going to be. Eight, with a commission free, it's going to be 18 cents on top of exchange fees. That's what it's going to be. Okay. So that, that's what it is for everything. Um, how, how long do markets generally take to reach a thicker tape when conditions are like they are today and last week? Hard to say right now. Usually about a month. Now you might have a day or two in there where things thicken up a little bit and calm down. But uh, typically you'll see conditions like this continue for anywhere from 30 to 90 days. Uh, and by that point, something has changed fundamentally. And if it hasn't, then we really are in, we're really gonna have problems. Um, that's the usual rule of thumb. So I would say expect to see more of this for the next couple of weeks and then just monitor what's going on with the virus and everything else and see what happens on the book. Um, how, 
how do I decide when to get back into a market after this type of situation? It's based on liquidity. You know, I, I would prefer to see that over that. It's just that simple. Um, you know, you're trying to find an edge, like I said. Do day trading margins have a limit? They do. Again, you know, you can look into that um, on the site. Uh, you, you say that you trade the, the 30 and the 10 year, um, but sometimes you trade the ES. What's the difference? Honestly, it's too, there's too much to get into, like in this presentation, but the ES is more about waves of momentum and treasuries. You tend to, to look for more imbalances and grab a few ticks here and there. Uh, someone says when you're talking about the imbalances, um, are you talking about in the yield curve or purely in the book? I'm talking about purely in the book. How many minutes does it take to get the rhythm of the order flow? Um, you know, it can sometimes be picked up right away as soon as you turn on the screen. And sometimes you have to sit for five or 10 minutes just to kind of get a feel. But basically you can see it immediately. I mean, you can see if price is moving or do you see a print every second or do you see a print every 30 seconds, right? That kind of helps you determine what it's like. Again, any questions on margin, I would direct towards trade of eight after the fact. Um, if you're experiencing slippage, um, obviously that's gonna take place in these conditions. Also, yeah, so somebody mentioned a volume stop. So a volume stop is what I was explaining here there's 1200 I'll say on the offer and you want to cover your short trade or go along, whatever the case may be, but only at the 1200 drops down to 500 realistically in fast conditions, you're not going to get the fill. There's too many firms in the world that have, um, an infrastructure much better than you. So they're going to get the fill and you're not because their orders are going to hit faster it can still be very useful in certain situations, particularly in thicker markets. I do use it in the treasuries, but when things are fast, it is best to just use the market order and, and give up the tick. Um, so you don't have that slippage or it's not as bad. Was, well, you know, was today's price action with the rate cut tradable? Um, or was it too random? I would say it's too random for most people. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, yeah. Um, videos that I'm suggesting, those are all on my site. So if you go to nobsdaytrading.com and go to the videos page right here, that'll take you to a bunch of free videos. It has all kinds of stuff on there. Uh, several with Jigsaw as well. Do I think we'll see negative interest rates in the U.S.? I have no idea. Uh, it's a possibility, but again, I don't really call that far out. Um, is it better to go to the internet or download? I definitely recommend, you know, if you're at home, just do the download straight to your desktop or your laptop, whatever the case may be. They just, that always just tends to be more stable. Um, not necessarily the design of the platform, but just your connection overall is better. Uh, um, <clears throat> any, any seminars coming up? Looks like someone's asking that. Oh, no, no nothing yet. in the near, uh, not right now. This is too crazy. Like, so probably, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I keep it posted if you are interested. Like, I'll have a link under, uh, I'm going to run a UX a year webinar too this year at some point, but um, you can click on like the markets and, um, that'll have the, the information, but yeah, I, I send out a blast. If you want, there's a subscription to a newsletter here and 
it's, I don't bombard you. I don't send spam ever. Um, so yeah, if you stay on that, I'll send out a notice three to four weeks before I'm planning on running one, but there's just no point right now. Really? It just wouldn't be, it would be too crazy. Um, so probably may, I would say late April or early may. Um, do I still have a discount for returning people? I do. Again, just contact me directly with that, please. And I'll tell you how many ticks target wise, you know, again, that all depends on your own strategy. Um, some people go for one or two ticks. Some people go for five or six and it, it, and it will depend on conditions again. So that's the other thing about context, right? If the market's rocking and rolling after a news event and you're on the right side, of a breakout move and you think there's a lot of potential, then you're not going to have a two tick stop or two tick profit target, right? You're probably going to go for more than that. If you're playing a range, then you're going to play a range and the range. So if the range is only four ticks wide, then you're probably only going to be going for two to four ticks on the range. It all depends on the situation. So yeah, I think that's about it, isn't it? I think it is. Actually, this is a good question. Yeah. Um, Bastion, can, can Canadians trade through you guys or are they limited on that like other people? Yeah, unfortunately not. If, if we do offer Canadian accounts in the future, then we'll, we'll be sure to, uh, you know, to, to let everyone know, especially those that have reached out to us in the past. But uh, as of now, unfortunately, we do not uh, allow Canadian accounts. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's common. I know, um, unfortunately, for a lot of people. It's weird. People from other countries can can have us accounts but not canadians uh yeah so that's about locks it up so oh so what's the site is no no bs day trading.com um that was a name i invented a long time ago so i'm pretty much stuck with it now but that's what it is no bs day trading.com and then i have all the information here a bunch of free stuff that you can check out um do one more question um so why do so many people, why are not that many people familiar with order flow? It's because up until recently, and by recently, really, I mean the last probably seven, eight years, six, seven years even, retail traders just did not have access to it. You know, they had never been on the floor. I didn't understand um, anything about it when I was first starting as a young guy in my early 20s. Uh, order books didn't exist. For most people, they, there were some for equities. They were pretty plain. And so if you'd never seen an order book or you were never on the floor of an exchange, you just have no idea about any of this stuff. So fortunately, really, for the retail guy over the years, the technology has become better and better. Platforms became better, and Internet connections obviously became much better. So this new world was opened up, and now the average guy can see the same thing that, you know, big firms are seeing for the most part in terms of the flow and it also it, it increased liquidity overall so <clears throat> where there used to be a situation where maybe only there were like a hundred guys trading the same product every day now there are a thousand guys trading that product because it, it's a global populace you know it opened it up to the globe um that's good and bad you know some days it's good because it makes moves bigger but some days it's bad because everybody's trying to do to do the same thing at the same time and it just ends up being quite choppy um, Here's one more. They, is, do you use a heat map, um, John, or do you do you, feel it, do you feel it is as good as a dome, or do you use both, so, or just the dome? So I just use the dome. Um, nothing against the heat map. It's a. It's again. It's a way to to have a a visual on the order book, but it's to extrapolating information or extracting information from the order book, right? So. I grew up, so to speak, on nothing but the DOM, you know, so when I was at the firms, this is all we had, and there was no heat map, there was no strength indicators, there weren't, you know, there was nothing. We didn't even have journal, journaling software at our firms, you know what I mean? So, obviously, my brain focused in on that, and I primarily just use the depth of market, um, but you can certainly incorporate the heat map, and if you're going to incorporate all the other stuff, what I would say is have your workspace with your ladders on one monitor and then put all your other stuff on the other monitor, your charts and your heat map and everything else. Um, and the more you look at the order book, 
the more I, usually the less you need the other stuff is how it tends to work. But you know, they're, they can be helpful at certain times. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, all right. One more question. Do I think the human behavior has changed much since Jesse Livermore was writing prices on a chalkboard? No, I do not. I mean, the world is better overall because of technology and, you know, medical advances and all that stuff. But as far as markets, no, it's all the same thing. That guy was trying to front run big orders. And today the high frequency trading programs are trying to front run big orders. It's all the same dynamics haven't changed it's buy low so high, um, you know, and try not to give away too much money when you're getting crushed. So with that, I will turn it back over to Bastion and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, if you have any questions, either no bsdaytrading.com for me, jigsawtrading.com for Peter, and tradeofate.com for tradeofate and those guys. Thanks, Bastion. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate John for the uh, the thorough webinar you pr you provided, and it was very um, <clears throat> educational and useful, uh, especially for those that have kind of just getting started. So it was it was very useful, I think, for them, and uh, a good good time to be showing some examples in this type of uh, these type of market conditions we have right now. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for the webinar. And like you said, if, if you have any questions, just reach out to any one of us uh, based on what your questions are. And uh, we were, we are always glad to help. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye-bye. Bye everybody.